Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Farming Matters, uh, a video ser story sharing series with the North Central SARE program. I am your host, Erin Schneider. I'm a farmer. I work with the North Central SARE region. I'm really excited to get to welcome um, our special guest today, Leah Zizi, who is a founding member of Ohilaku. And Leah is going to take us to the story of her SARE grant project, which was all, is all about indigenous corn with reduced tillage and cover cropping. And I am excited that you could just share the backstory and what drew you to the project and where things are going now. Leah, welcome. How are you? Thank you, Erin. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. So I'm Leah Zizi, um, as you said, and I'm Wolf Clan. I'm from Oneida. I grew up here um, and I'm really it's an honor to be part of Ohilagu Corn Cooperative. So I'm happy to share a little bit more about that. Um, I'm going to talk about actually our second SARE project. Um, and I'll talk about, yeah, there was a first project and then it led into a second project. So we've had a lot of great success um, working with SARE. So um, I think when people hear about corn or growing corn, they think about what they see every day, which is rows and rows and rows and rows of hybrid or GMO corn that is perfectly uniform, almost like militaristically uniform. You know, just all their, all their ears are pointing exactly the same angle. It's, it's like there's these clones out there. Um, and then, or they might think of sweet corn from the store. Um, and this is just something completely and totally different. So um, these are seeds that have been handed down from generation to generation to generation. And in fact, our people are originally from what is now upstate New York. So when we made our journey here 200 years ago, we had to bring these seeds with us and then have a really hard winter here in this area and not eat those seeds all winter long so that we could save them to the next spring and plant them. And the reason that we did that was because we knew how important it would be for the next generation to have this sustenance and this food that provides so much. So our flint corn, our, our white corn is our, really our sustenance corn. And when you eat it with beans and squash, you get a complete amino acid profile. So you don't necessarily even need to eat meat to get that full protein from eating our traditional foods. They're that nutrient dense. Um, and then of course, they're a really important part of our identity, our creation story, our ceremonial cycle. Um, we give thanks for the corn. We make offerings at the beginning of the year and then at the end of the year for the corn, um, because it's really said that the health of the corn is reflected in the health of the people. So as we start to turn back all of the chapters of history that have really separated us from these traditional foods, we are healing ourselves, not just biologically because we're able to eat really nutrient dense foods again, but we're healing ourselves spiritually and we're healing ourselves emotionally from all of the damage that has been done over time. And so it's really meaningful to grow foods of our ancestors and grow them in a good way. And that's why I think it never occurred to us to run a machine through the field once the corn is up, because you wouldn't want to damage this corn. You wouldn't want to combine it and have seeds flying all over the place. You wouldn't want to really, like every kernel gets picked up from the floor when we're doing our work. Um, she's that important to us and that special to us. So it's really, um, we're, we're holding up our end of the bargain and our relationship and our treaty with these seeds to take care of one another when we're planting our corn. Um, we don't expect her to take care of us unless we take care of her, right? And so when we think about her value, it's not in how much her yield is or how much we can sell her for. Her value is in her cultural meaning to us and in knowing that we are just stewards of these seeds for the next generation. So um, a lot of what we are doing with our cooperative, um, we are growing corn, which is um, sacred to our people. It is one of our first foods. And we're also growing community and we're growing farmers and we're growing soil. So um, we got started because we had a shortage of corn in our community. 
And what we didn't realize was that by growing corn, we were growing all of these other things and all these other benefits. So that's been one of the really great outcomes of this project. Um, just to get started on like how we got started farming or what got us interested in this, I have to take you back to the beginning of time. So this is um, growing corn with beans and squash as a traditional practice of the Oneida people who are part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, and it's one of our traditional soil amendment practices is to grow in polyculture. You hear a lot about the three sisters. Um, there are a lot of systems that are actually seven sisters. So involving sunflowers, involving tobacco, involving all kinds of other co-beneficial plants that grow together. Um, and then of course that extends outwards to, you know, just general land management practices um, and really striving to create abundance for the next seven generations. So um, when we got started with this project, we inherited some very um, conventionally farmed land that was really struggling. The soil was really struggling. And we had a lot of, um, a lot of challenges with that. So you can see our soil here is really pale. It's really clayey. Um, and the, the corn is just fighting its way through this soil. Um, the seeds that we grew, um, we didn't even have enough seeds when we got started because um, we were just background backyard farmers that started growing together in a cooperative the way our ancestors did, um, basically in a communal field. And so we had to make a big trade with our relatives out in Onondaga Nation wild rice for corn seeds so we could have enough to even get started our first year. Um, so we're really grateful to our relatives and our ancestors for carrying these seeds forward to us so that we can be the ones to steward them for the next generation. And a lot of what we're doing now is making sure that we're stewarding the soil properly too. So um, of course, there's a lot of changes unfolding with the climate right now. Um, and with that, there's a lot of risk and uncertainty. We started farming at a very rough time to start farming. If you're a beginning farmer right now, man, I feel you. So we had those big floods a few years ago that wiped out like 95% of our field. Um, and so we really started thinking, you know, we have this conventional farming method that the people in our group who know how to farm on a large scale, this is what they were taught and this is what they're carrying forward. But we know we have these other teachings and these other ways of going about things that regenerate the soil. So we really wanted to bring those forward with what we were doing. So when we got together as a cooperative, we decided we would hold those traditional values really close and try to carry that on to the next generation. Um, and so this is just a few pictures of throughout the year, what our process looks like. We harvest all of our corn by hand, and then we pull the husks back and we braid the corn into long braids to dry it, um, which is a huge labor of love. It takes us about a thousand hours to harvest an acre this way, um, but it keeps us really connected and it keeps us really um, aware of what's going on in the soil, what's going on in the community, what's going on with the seeds and our kids and all of that. It's just a lot of time to be together. And we also have been looking a lot at our traditional practices to bring those forward. So um, on the right, you see our attempt to get this very low lying field out of the water. We got a hilling machine um, that makes these long rows and that allows us to do the polyculture with the corn beans and squash, which were traditionally grown in a mound system. And this is actually very reminiscent of ancestral mound practices that you can find all over what is now Wisconsin um, and all over the Northeast. These are some Menominee mounds or the, ancestor, the ancestors of the Menominees actually. Um, so if you're walking around the woods and you start seeing the earth doing these wavy things, that's that ancestral practice that's still here today. So we like to think that we're kind of walking with the ancestors when we do practices like this. Um, and then we intercede in between these with um, clover to help build the soil back up. We've also gotten into cover cropping, which of course has a million billion and one benefits. So um, that's been really fun for us to learn about that. Um, it kind of, what it reminds me of with cover cropping is our traditional practice of moving our villages around our territory every 20 or so years to return back to the same place a hundred years later when everything has been regenerated. And of course we cannot pick up our whole reservation or even our whole cornfield and move it every 20 years, but we can rotate with cover crops in between and we can put cover crops in between the rows to um, get some of those benefits. So that's what we have started doing. And this SARE project was all about 
what does that do for the soil and what does that do for the yields? And what is the impact on the quality of the corn that comes off the field? Because we're really looking for seed quality cobs to come off. And when our corn is like fully, fully, when she's loving it out there, she's like 18 inch row, like cobs, like eight rows, beautiful white corn. So we, we see right away that we're doing something good for the corn because she tells us right away. Um, this is the experiment that we did in partnership with UW Extension. Um, we had um, Daniel Hayden was the PhD student that was working with us and Aaron Silva at CIAS, um, Center for Integrated Agriculture Studies. Um, they helped us design and carry out this project. So we did intercropping with Dutch white, clover, plantain, chicory, and winter wheat. Um, you can see our seeding right there. It's a little bit small. Sorry about that small font. Um, and then you can see the varieties that we use with those different cover crops. And then we did basically trials within the field where we did different applications of these cover crops. And then we looked at what happened to yield, what did the soil look like, and what did that do for um, weed suppression? And um, the interesting thing about all of this is that when we got started on this project, we first started with no-till, which was really, really hard for us because our corn has such a long season um, and it's can be easy for a no-till cover to compete with what you're trying to plant. We had a hairy veg situation that was out of control one year. So um, we have not gone to no-till because we think just our soil isn't ready for it. It's not repaired enough for it. And getting the timing right with our like 110 day corn is kind of hard. Um, but there are a lot of benefits to no-till and if it works for your variety of corn, it's a great way to sequester carbon. Um, it's just not working for us right now. And that was one of the outcomes of this project. Um, these are some of the many partners that were involved. Um, throughout our development. Sarah has actually been a partner since day one. So when we got together to grow corn as a cooperative, it was like a pilot year. We didn't really know how it was gonna work and we have any money. And so we wrote for a Sarah Farmer Rancher grant to study fish emulsion because one of our traditional practices is burying fish guts in those uh, corn beans and squash mounds. And so we did a trial with that and we had a really good results and it really brought us together and it coalesced us into being a cooperative. So we started through a Sarah grant, which is pretty cool. And then we got to come back and do another one talking about the cover crops and those benefits. So it's been a really great partnership. Um, this time around, Metaconicum, um, Menominee Rebuilders was also a partner in the project and they did a cover crop study as well. And they were able to hire an intern to help them with that um, field data and um, management practices. So that was another great outcome of the project. Um, so what we decided, um, one of the big, just a couple of weeks ago, we decided one of the big outcomes was that the traditional or I guess conventional farmers in the group finally relented and acknowledged that our system does produce better yields with the cover crops. And so now we're not going to be plowing every year. We're not going to be doing deep tillage. We're just going to be doing low till and intercropping with a cover crop rotation. So for us that were involved in the research side of this project, it feels like a huge win because we were definitely getting a lot of side eye and we were not having good results the first few years because we were tinkering with things. Um, but we came through on top and we're very excited to have cover crops involved in all of our um, fields going forward. Um, and then also we, one of our climate um, adaptation strategies is to see, save seeds every year and take notes on those seeds. Um, and so this coming year, our notes will say that they were all grown with cover crops. So I'm excited to see that in our notes going forward. And then this picture in the middle is some of our other Haudenosaunee varieties, which are just absolutely beautiful. So I'm really looking forward to doing some more trials with different varieties of corn to see how those turn out too. So um, this was a really great uh, experience working with Sarah. It really connected young people, old people, and everybody in between with these practices. Um, it gave us an opportunity to participate in science um, with the university. And we had developed a really good working relationship with, with UW Extension um, and with Meniconicum and with a lot of other folks that were just curious about what we were doing. 
Um, we had a couple of field days and we organized one of them during our recital of our great law in August of last year. And we had 30 people come out to the field so we could share our story with them. So it's been a really positive experience. Um, and I think if you're a farmer or a rancher and you're thinking about if you want to go after a SARA grant or not, I highly recommend you do because they're really easy to work with. It's probably the easiest grant I've ever worked on. Um, and there's so much support and so much care. So I say go for it. And that's all I have. Y'all go. Thank you for sharing. Um, there's like a lot of layers in there, even though it's not me. Um, one of the questions I have you know, that come up for me is, okay, so you have have uh, navigating all, you know, lots of different partners may have different structures and ways of organizing and doing things like, you know, how, I mean, you're able to come together from the shared project. Yes. But how did you kind of navigate those? Maybe like, were they, were you all aligned from the get-go or were there different things you had to kind of overcome in, in working together and figuring out a good, good way to do that? So one of the things I really like about the farmer rancher grant is the funds come right to the farmer so mm -hmm. that we can make decisions, game time decisions that need to be made um, and get the funds out to like buy soil amendments or buy cover crop seed or, you know, whatever needs to be done that's part of the project. Whereas if the money had gone to the university, we had to go through a procurement process, mm -hmm. they would have taken a big indirect cost cut right off the top and the funds wouldn't have necessarily been applied all to the project like they were in our case. Um, so I felt like the relationship and communication that we had between the university and Ohilagu from the beginning was really good because we were both on the same page that Ohilagu was the primary applicant and UW Extension was supporting us. Um, and then we were able to manage funds and get funds out to Meniconicum also, or just like buy fertilizer and have it delivered directly to their farm for them. So I think that was one of the things that administratively was pretty easy. We were all on the same page about how to do that. Um, and then when it came to time to harvest, you know, we just had UW Extension folks come up and we harvested with them so they could kind of talk to us about the different plots as we were going through the field. We could kind of date them and label them. They brought all the corn back to um, UW to put in their drying room and dry them down and weigh them. And then they delivered back fresh husked, beautiful corn for us. So <laughs> that was a win-win <laughs> for sure. Um, cause that cut down on the amount of labor that we have to do at harvest, which is significant. Um, other than that, I felt like it was very, very smooth. Um, there was a lot of problem solving that had to be done at the beginning about how much cover crop of what kind to buy and how we're going to set these trials up. Um, but everybody's opinion was really welcome in that space. And so it really felt like a positive collaboration. Can well, you are um, contemplating taking doing something different in terms of an experiment on the farm using a corn variety or any any seed variety that is somewhat special and limited in quantity how do you balance um, the, the excitement and interest in in experimentation with the risk of the seed or losing the seed or, or the project not working out? That's a great question. So uh, when we go through and hand harvest our corn, we separate our corn into seed quality corn and we call it soup quality corn, it goes on the other side. So when we did our first year of experimentation, we didn't use the seed quality corn, we used the soup quality corn so that it wouldn't diminish our limited seed stocks. Um, then when we got up and we got it working okay, then we started using the seed quality corn. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also hedged our bets. We had the research field, which was an acre and a half. And then we also had the conventional field, which is about three or four acres. So we knew even if we had total failure, which we did one year of this project have total failure. And there was a lot of reasons for that. We had poor recommendations from our agronomist. The timing was just really bad. It was a really weird year around planting time. And so all the corn grew up and it looked like baby corn. It was so mm. sad out there. So we lost the whole field that year, mm. um, but we still had the conventional field where, you know, they plowed it up, they put down all the fertilizer, mm. they did everything their conventional way. And so we still had that corn to harvest. What would be kind of words of wisdom when you kind of take on that transitional 
space of like you coming into this land that in the soil that needs some TLC and how to how to sort of sequence that out. I think going into it with a mindset that it is an experiment. So mm -hmm. you are gonna learn something, whether or not you get a great yield that year or not, you will learn something. Um, so we learned that you should double check the math of your agronomist one year. And that's a been valuable lesson. Now we'll never make that mistake again. Um, and so I think going in with that beginner's mind, like this is a first pancake, this is a first try, you might fall down, is really helpful because then you don't get discouraged right away. Because once you fine tune it, then you have that weed suppression is already built in. So you don't have to go out and hand weed or cultivate. Then you're starting to rebuild your soil. So when we do have more frequent droughts and droughts and floods, you don't have to worry so much about whether or not your corn is going to make it because your soil is healthy enough to be resilient enough against some of those changes. And that's what really what we're going for is having a resilient field so we can count on these seeds making it into the next generation and the generation afterwards. So I think if you can set your intention that you are going to figure it out and you're going to have mistakes, it makes it easier to get over those when you do have mistakes. Well, if there's any other thing that you wanted to offer up that sort of is in your heart that feels a little left unsaid if before we end our time together, at least on the video side of it. I would just say that um, all you might be really inspired right now to run out and find some indigenous seeds. And I would caution you to think about the source of the seeds and think about the meaning of the seeds um, and try instead to grow an heirloom seed that has already been in the hands of non-Indigenous people for some time. Um, because of the sacred nature of our seeds and because of the situation that we're in and rebuilding our communities, we are trying to protect the seeds as much as possible right now. Um, but we really encourage you to have a relationship with heirloom seeds and corn, um, but maybe just choose varieties that aren't identified as indigenous. Um, it's a bit taboo to sell indigenous seeds. So if you see a um, seed company that's selling tribal seeds, just be a little bit wary of that and think about where those seeds might have come from and where they might belong to be right now. Um, and please just you know be mindful of the seeds and varieties that you choose to grow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you know corn has something going on it's like bringing lots of things together right now she's got yes. plans man yeah, yeah seriously <laughs> seriously <laughs> i bow to that and to you and to marie yeah <laughs> thank you thank, thank you, you both this has been a pleasure oh yeah always thank you again <laughs> take care